So, here's what oxygen does in the mitochondrial membrane. It specifically damages polyunsaturated fatty acids like linoleic acid and linolenic acid. And it does so in a chain reaction. So one oxygen species can damage lots and lots of fatty acids. So this is a simply terrible situation. And what Misha Shepanov realized was that the oxidation reaction is specific for one carbon or two carbons, which don't seem to play an important role in any other metabolism of these compounds. So he arranged to make, and actually these compounds were all originally made in, in uh, Minsk, uh, in Belarusia. He, met, he arranged, he's a synthetic chemist, that made derivatives of these uh, fatty acids with specific deuterium substitution either at the carbons that are attacked by oxygen or at other carbons as a control. Okay? And then working with a bunch of collaborators, we've asked whether these specific deuterium substitutions can protect against oxidative damage. Okay. Now, if you're not familiar with deuterium, the properties of a deuterated organic compound are virtually indistinguishable from the normal, except the chemical reactions that occur at the deuterium itself. Everything else is pretty much the same. Similarly, the physical properties of deuterated compounds are pretty much identical. So linoleic and linoleic acid are required human nutrients. We don't make them. We have to eat them, fish oil. So Misha realized, and as you'll see, this turns out to be true, that if he fed animals these deuterated compounds, they would go naturally to wherever the ordinary dietary component goes. Why is this so important? You know, I'm sure, that most drugs fail in clinical trials. Why do they fail? It's because they don't go to the right place. It's not that they can't function if they got to the right place, but they never get there. Okay, bioavailability is the major reason for drug therapy. But if you're engineering a nutrient, basically trying to turn a nutrient into a drug, you've solved the problem of bioavailability because the body already knows where that compound is supposed to go and puts it there. Okay, so we're first going to try these on yeast. And this is a collaboration with uh, uh, Kathy Clark at UCLA. And uh, yeast don't have little A and little N acid. They don't have polyunsaturated fatty acids. Okay. And it's a good thing. Because if you try to grow yeast on these compounds, it makes them sick. Why does it make them sick? Because of oxidative damage. <laughs> right. And to exacerbate the effect, what Kathy did was to take a, a mutant yeast which is especially sensitive to oxidative damage. So what you're looking at is dilution plating of three yeast strains. Uh, you can see one of them is labeled wild type, and the bottom one is called COC3 deletion, and we can forget the center one. Okay? And if you grow yeast without fatty acids in the medium, you can see that all three strains grow well. I mean, the mutant and the wild type are indistinguishable. But if you grow these same strains on a linoleic acid, you can see the structure, the mutant can't grow. It, this is completely toxic. And if you put deuterium at, quote unquote, the wrong position, it's completely toxic. But if you put the deuterium at the site which is normally oxidized, you can see it's exactly like wild type. Okay? 
So this is really an amazing result. Just two deuterium atoms is life or death for this system. But now the problem with what I showed you is that this is 100% substitution in the dice. Okay? And we're never going to be able to take a human or even a mouse and completely substitute all the fatty acid with deuterium. So we did dilution experiments, and uh, I'll just show you the, just look at the um, uh, middle row here, which is little aic acid again. You can see that 100% little aic acid is toxic, but just 10% deuterium is protective. Okay. Why? Why, is, why is, does such a small amount of isotope uh, give you complete protection? Because this is a chain reaction that's damaging. And you only have to block the chain in one position. And the deuterium apparently does that. We're not completely sure why it's so effective. Uh, and then the chain is dead. OK. So this is yeast. Who cares? But now I want to show you cells that represent the best known model for a serious human disease. So the disease is prefix ataxia. We know absolutely the molecular mechanism of this disease. Completely understood. There's a gene called protaxin. The role of protaxin is to pump excess iron out of mitochondria. Patients who have this disease don't make enough protaxin. As a result, iron accumulates, free iron accumulates in their mitochondria. Iron promotes oxidative stress horrifically. And these patients, by the time they're in their teens, are in wheelchairs with serious uh, neuromuscular uh, deterioration. There is absolutely no therapy for this disease. It's rare, about 5,000 cases in the U.S. OK, so the best model thus far for this disease actually turned out to be mouse cells, not human cells, in which this abnormal protaxin sequence has been genetically engineered. And so what we're looking here is the viability of mouse cells that have been treated with various regimens. And I'll try to run through this. Um, on the left is a control, and you can see the cells are all living. All right, that's pretty good. Uh, the second uh, set of samples labeled here F plus B, those cells have been oxidatively stressed by being treated with iron, and, and you can see that 60% uh, of them are dead. The third is an antioxidant called the Debenone, which, as you can see, protects these cells very nicely, but it fails human trials completely. No bioavailability. Right? Now, all the remaining columns are these mouse cells being grown either with the purple, uh, the dark purple, the deuterated little laic acid, or uh, the, the lighter color, the hydrogen. And you can see if we look from right to left that the more, it's just like the yeast, the more <laughs> hydrogenated little laic acid that we, we give these cells, uh, the more toxic it is until finally we kill all the cells just because they have a natural nutrient present. But you can see that the deuterium is uh, highly protective, as protective as, as this drug, which unfortunately failed human trials. OK. So our job now is to convince the FDA in the US to let us give deuterated little egg acid uh, to people. And we're almost there. We had a great meeting with the FDA a few weeks ago, and they're very encouraging, because these patients are not being helped by anything. Okay. Now, if you think about this, purified little aic acid is an FDA-approved drug. Even though it hurts yeast, 
and even though it causes oxidative damage. For patients who have severe cachexia, um, that's massive weight loss, as in late stage cancer, uh, linoleic acid is used intravenously in massive dose to try to put some bulk back on these patients. Okay? So, um, and you can buy these things, and some of you probably take these things as nutritional supplements. Okay? Unfortunately, you can't yet get the deuterated one. Okay? And the FDA has long allowed people for investigational purposes to substitute deuterium for hydrogen and use mass spectrometry because this is the way we monitor metabolism. <laughs> but those investigational studies are short-term. And so our job is to try to convince the FDA that it will be safe to keep people on this stuff indefinitely. And here's what we showed them thus far. Mice, not people, were grown on a very expensive mouse cow consisting entirely of deuterated linoleic acid as the only source of linoleic acid. You have to have linoleic acid. It's a required nutrient for mice as well. And then we used fancy mass spectrometry together with Tom Brenner at Cornell to monitor what fatty acids were present in different tissues and where the deuterium was. So this is Linoleic acid, you can see, is all the way over on the left. Okay? Linolenic acid is kind of mostly on the right. These knights also had deuterated linolenic acid as well as linoleic acid, so they had a double dose. And if you grow mice without deuterium, you can see that although you feed them linoleic and linolenic acid, uh, I see misspelled, uh, that they rapidly converted into a whole bunch of other compounds, including arachidonic acid and EPA and DHA, things that you may have heard about, that are the actual uh, unsaturated fatty acids that populate um, mitochondrial membranes. But after 90 days, you can see that we've incorporated a significant amount of deuterium, and more important, we haven't changed the distribution of any of these normal metabolic products. So it looks as though the mice don't know that they're being fed deuterium at all in the brain. It's also true in the liver, and it's also true in the retina, and every other tissue that we can look at. Okay, so as far as we can tell, the mice didn't know that they got deuterium uh, instead of hydrogen. Um, not just in terms of where the lipids are and what the lipids are, but in terms of what the mice look like. They seem to be unharmed. So based on this, um, what we are hoping in the next few weeks is that the FDA will tell us to start dosing rats. And 90 days after we start dosing rats, if the rats are doing okay, we expect them to let us start dosing people. So sometime roughly a year from now, uh, we should know if this very novel approach uh, offers protection against uh, Friedrich's ataxia. Now, if it does, then the same compound will be tried in many other cases, including diabetic retinopathy, uh, age-related macular degeneration, Parkinson's disease, etc., etc. Okay. Uh, but uh, Friedrich's ataxia is a better place to start because progression is rapid. Because once these patients start to deteriorate, you can tell in a six-month period by various quantitative measures that they're losing significant neuromuscular function. 
risk of diseases like Parkinson's or diabetic retinopathy, you'd have to dose for years uh, to see an effect. And, and uh, we have to start with things that are quick. But the goal here is to have, in principle, a rather simple strategy, if it works, uh, to try to protect against major diseases. OK, so I'm going to stop. I told you three stories. I've run over just a few minutes. Uh, I'd be happy to answer some questions. And um, I suppose even if you like, uh, there are at least a few bilingual people in the room. So if you would rather ask the question in Russian, Alex can probably translate. Thank you. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, yeah, just in case. Oh. So you can find materials there. Oh, okay. Great. Sorry. Right. I didn't know that slide was us. <laughs> okay. That's why it's not on my list, right? Any questions? What was the for that? You're going to have to be loud if you don't have a microphone. Come up to a microphone. Uh, let's see if there is a microphone. Yeah. My hearing is not great. Yeah. Uh, no, there's no microphone. So you have to be loud. Uh, is this replacement for uh, oh, here's the mic. Sorry. Uh, is this replacement uh, influence on metabolism of lipids? Normal metabolism, like oxidation, oxida not oxidation stress, like, um, I don't know, normal uh, lipid metabolism. Uh, when uh, lipids are Structured in the uh, AC, uh, acetyl, acetyl, acetyl coa and something like this. It's different. Right. You're, and I think, okay, right, right. Yeah. So I think what you're asking me is the me about the mechanism of breakdown of normal lipids. The lipids are turned over and you know broken down into pieces, and, and then new lipids yeah. are resynthesized from those pieces. And what you're asking me is, is the breakdown of these deuterated compounds normal? Yes. And it's a great question, and I don't know the answer. <laughs> right? We haven't checked that yet. Yeah. Uh, that's something we're going to have to do, but we haven't checked that yet. Uh, I suspect it is, uh, because if it were, if, if they couldn't break down at all, then we would have expected the levels to go up to 100% after 90 days, OK? And if they broke down too quickly, then we shouldn't see them at all. So the fact that we see the normal balance of various lipids suggests to me that the breakdown is OK. But we haven't actually proved it. Okay? We don't actually have data. Thank you. So you don't know. Hello. So you don't know the mechanism of action of deuterium. Uh, you don't know the mechanism of action of deuterium in production well, we, of vaccines. Well, we, uh, I can I can tell you what I think the mechanism is, um, but it's very hard to prove it. Okay. Um, if you pick up a review article about um, fatty acid oxidation. Um, what they usually say is that the kinetics of fatty acid oxidation are so complex that nobody understands them. And so, so um, what, what I believe, based on the data we have and, and based on what's published, is that the deuterium is very substantially shortening the length of these radical chains. That's what I believe. Okay. So that instead of maybe propagating for 50 steps as in the hydrogen, that if you have the deuterium uh, there, that the chains tend to quench. And maybe you only propagate five steps. Okay? And if you think about what's likely to be happening in a mitochondria, you damage a lipid, and then you have this cascade of damage. And then eventually, you may also damage a protein. And so I think if you can shorten the uh, length of this chain reaction substantially, you should get a tremendous effect. Deuterium isotope effects are 
No, and we know in this case what the primary isotope effect is because we can measure that and it's about a factor of eight in this case. So the actual abstraction of that deuterium is eight times slower than hydrogen. But that's not enough to explain these gigantic effects that we're seeing. Okay, nowhere near enough. We're, we're looking at factor of 50 or 100 effects here. So it's probably something much more dramatic like shortening the chain. But it turns out to be very difficult to prove that. We're still working on it with some of the world's experts at this point. Good task for biophysics. <laughs> well, exactly right. Yeah. Uh, you know, a lot of publications there were uh, before about issues of heavy water, deuterium water, on the um, growth of plants and so on. Yeah, and did you try to uh, replace hydrogen with deuterium in uh, proteins? Or okay, right. So that, that's a very good question, and it, it allows me to make a, an important point that I didn't have time to say. Heavy water is toxic. It depends on the, uh, on the water. concentration, right? Yeah, but if you, you can't live on pure heavy water or even 50% heavy water, okay? And because the hydrogen in water can exchange and go everywhere, okay? So the hydrogen on these lipids cannot exchange. That is, it's, it's covalently attached to the lipid, right? So unless it's damaged and removed, it's not going to go anywhere else. And the total amount of deuterium that we're adding to a person with these lipids is much less than the amount of natural deuterium they have already in their water. Okay? So it's the difference between a completely general effect of deuterium, which is bad, and this very, very site-specific effect, which is controlled. 